มโนปุมังกมาธรรมามโนสัยธามโนมยา Phenomena are preceded by the mind, ruled by the mind, made of the mind. This is the Buddha's assertion of the power of the mind. We're not simply on the receiving end of things. The mind is what shapes our experience. Sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations do come in through the senses, but we wouldn't experience them if it weren't for the fact that the mind is going out looking for them. In the Buddhist analysis, even prior to sensory contact, there's a lot of things going on in the mind: thoughts, intentions, perceptions, fabrications of various kinds. These are the things that shape our experience now and on into the future. And because the mind has power, that means it can use it in various ways. If it didn't have choices, the power would be meaningless. But this is a power for good or for evil, or for very good. This is why we're meditating. We realize that by training the mind, we make a big difference. If the mind is untrained, it's like an animal that hasn't been trained. You let it run around in your house; it tears up the curtains, tears up the furniture, leaves messes here and there. But if you train it, you can actually get it to do useful things. It fetches the newspaper. I knew of a dog one time in Thailand. We stayed at a monastery. They were building a Buddha image up the hill, and it would follow the workers up the hill every morning. So they outfitted it with saddle bags, <coughs> put sand in the bags, and every morning it would wait in place to get the saddle bags fixed and the sand put in it. And then it would carry the sand up the mountain that was used to mix the concrete. So that's a trained animal. You can imagine if your own mind is trained, how much good it can do. The Buddha discovered the power of the mind on the night of his awakening. He saw all the various activities in the mind that create suffering. He started with aging, illness, and death, and worked back down through becoming and craving. Sensory contact, the things that come prior to sensory contact, finally got down to fabrications. When he brought knowledge to the process of fabrications, they ceased, because this was a knowledge that put an end to passion for fabricating. When there's no passion, why would you do it? The fabrications cease, and then even the fabrications of the knowledge that put an end to them. Those ceased as well. He relinquished those. That's how he found the deathless. And so he saw the power of the mind, both in the fact that it can make a difference, and in the fact that the mind has a purpose. That's what fabrication is all about. You do fabrications for the sake of something, which implies an action that gives results, cause and effect. And it's a particular kind of cause and effect. It's not mechanical. But the mechanical cause, the cause itself has no intentions with regard to what kind of effects it's going to have. It just does things willy nilly. Like the pictures of lava. It's a volcano on an island off in the Canary Islands. It's erupting right now, and it sends these streams of lava down the hill. The lava has no intention. 
just comes up and then follows the, the power of gravity and goes down, destroying houses, destroying villages, but with no intention. That's a mechanical cause. Then there's something called teleological cause, where the cause actually has a purpose. It wants to try to attain something. And in a universe where there is teleology, things are done for a purpose. That shows the mind is not just the result of physical processes. It's the shaper. It's the one that inspires these things, incites things to happen. So when the Buddha put this together, the principle of cause and effect, and the fact that causes could be either producing desirable things or undesirable things, that gives us the Four Noble Truths. Craving is, an un, is the cause of something und, undesirable, which is suffering. Whereas the path leads to the dispassion, it puts an end to suffering. So the Four Noble Truths are an expression of the power of the mind. And of its highest power, its power to put an end to suffering. So we have these powerful minds, and what do we do with them? For the most part, we fritter away our time. A mood comes in, and we let the mind be pushed around by little tiny things. What other people do, what other people don't do, or just random moods that come in. It's a huge waste of this power, because we end up using the power to make ourselves miserable and getting in the way of doing things that are really good, where we really can make an important difference in our lives and the lives of others. So when you find your mind slipping into a bad mood, remind yourself you don't have to be there. There is a power someplace in your mind to change things, and change things for the good. And again, this is why we meditate. If the mind didn't have a power, there would be no purpose in trying to train the mind. But because it does have the power to make the difference between suffering and not suffering, it's really important that it be trained. Then you get it to do what you want it to do. So you tell it to stay with the breath. You tell it to settle in with the breath in a way that feels really good. You tell it to ask questions about how to settle in well, what kind of breathing feels good right now, and when it does feel good, what to do with it. It's all very simple. But you want your power of your mind to be well-founded. So you start with the simple things and work up. And you find that over time you can come to trust the mind more and more. As the Buddha said, if you can't trust yourself, who are you going to trust? Unfortunately, the mind has many voices. You can say unfortunately or fortunately. It's unfortunate that there's so much confusion. But you can use that to your advantage. Some of the voices in the mind are more skillful than others. So try to identify the skillful ones. Side with those. Let them have the power inside your mind, so that the power of the mind as a whole will be well used. It 
Think about it when the Buddha is talking about the Four Noble Truths. He's talking about your mind. All the various powers of the mind can fall someplace in there. So which side are you on? The side of the path or the side of craving? Because that's a lot of what our moodiness is about. We crave things that we don't get. And then we get upset. Particularly in the realm of pleasant things that we'd like to see, hear, smell, taste, touch. You'd like to see the world in a different place. And then when it's not a different place, or that it doesn't respond to our desires, we make ourselves miserable. Because one of the basic principles of the Four Noble Truths, that power of the mind, is that we have the power to make ourselves suffer, or we have the power to get out of that suffering. But the suffering we feel, the one that, suffering that weighs down the mind, is the one that comes from within. To try to tease things out when you're suffering. Where in the mind? Which of those actions? Craving, clinging, intention, attention, perception, which of those are causing the problems? And realize that you can change. There's a basic duality here. It's very ironic that Buddhist wisdom is supposed to be all about oneness and non-duality. For the Four Noble Truths, you've got two dualities. And the message is, you can make a difference. Always keep that in mind.